it's the next level. I believe some folks on this train forget just how generous and wonderful a man Mr. Wilford actually is. Not me. I could never forget. It's Wilford who runs our sacred engine. It's Wilford who has his finger on our pulse, who knows exactly what we need, how much food and water, how much heat and space, how much discipline. It's Wilford who saved us from the bitter cold. He's the only reason we're alive. Yet somehow, on this train we all call home, there are passengers who see fit to challenge him. Passengers who think they know better. Passengers who take for granted this great miracle that he's given us. Hey panelers, welcome to the show. I'm Steve. And I'm Kat. It is our 99th episode, Kat. I am so excited to have you with us. Mark is taking a a little bit of a break, and so I am joined by the lovely and wonderful Kat. We've heard her voice a few times, we've heard her feedback, but now we have her live, in person, on the Panels to Pixels podcast, covering Snowpiercer, Season 1, Episode 8. So tell me, Kat, what were your initial thoughts about this episode? Oh, This episode, just like so many of the other ones, it's just packed full of so many answers, more than questions, and that's usually what I have. But it was phenomenal. It was phenomenal, just like uh, so many of the last episodes. It's film-like. The cinematography is great. The movie, or the story moves forward quickly. You can call it a movie. Go ahead, yeah. I was trying to say the story moves forward really quickly and with lots of action, and I just loved it. Yeah, I I watched it the first time I watched it on my iPad at my sister's house. I was on vacation and I got confused towards the end. And so when I got home, I had to uh, watch it a couple more times just so I could, because there's so much, like you said, packed into this episode and I, I really, really loved it. And I'm with you. This, it continues to amaze me what they can do with filming and and digital and, and what actors and actresses can do. It just amazes me sometimes the way they're able to show emotion and I'm really, really impressed with this show and I'm excited. I'm sad that it's going to end here in a week. Yeah, I am too. I am too. I can't wait, but yes, everything is so high caliber and for a basic cable, it's amazing what they're doing right from the stars they have, just like you said, to the storyline, to the action. It's phenomenal. Precisely. So the synopsis that they gave us for uh, for season season one, episode eight of Snowpiercer, these are his revolutions, is the revolution has finally come and Leighton leads the lower classes forward in armed rebellion. Melanie's house of cards collapses and she's in danger of becoming the first casualty. That's a really good short synopsis. I, I'm really been impressed with the IMDb synopses. Yeah, synopses of these episodes. All right, so on our top fives, I'm going to go ahead and let you start, if you'd like. Good evening, passengers. Be advised, track conditions will deteriorate over the next 24 hours. All right. Uh, Well, personally, I have a hard time going, this is my favorite, one, two, three, four, five. So they're not in necessarily any order. But my number five was just the cinematography, like I had mentioned before, from the cool, calm tones up in the engine in first class to the you know, gritty tail section. And boy, we'll get into it later, but in the action pieces with the blood. And it's just, it is like a movie. It reminds me of 300, maybe a mm-hmm. little of Sin City, the way they've taken oh, yeah. a comic and put it on the screen and used a lot of those same elements. There, there's definitely a drastic difference between the shots done in the engine room that are bright and the walls are all white and it's clean, even though it's kind of a Spartan existence for Javi. I had written a whole thing about the Javi character that I just completely dismissed. I really think his actions in this episode are so small. 
oh, but there's so meaningful. Oh, yeah. I want to know more about that character. Yeah. I don't know if we will in, you know, just having two episodes left, but every one of these characters I want to know a little more about. Yeah. 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 And I, and I love you mentioned that because that stark contrast between, like I said, the brightly lit engine room. And then when we get as the, it seems almost like as it gets slowly further and further back, you get this more grittier, darker, less light. And then we get the night car, which the feeling for me that the night car is kind of like the middle. It's like between, you know, second and third class. And that's the place where everybody kind of meets up. Right. And all the classes, that's the few times when all three of the classes are going to maybe not be completely together because first class, you know, has got that balcony. But you've got second and third class people there mingling. I don't know why I went straight into the night car, but. Um. <laughs> well, it's a place where they all have the possibility of meeting, whether first class goes back often or not. But I think you're right. You're right. It's the cantina of the train. It is. And it's really, really cool. And, and I wonder if they're going to lose that now that the rebellion has begun. My number five is just uh, kind of the character of Ruth. I've been really impressed with Allison Wright and the way she's been playing this character is just amazing. I think we see the loss of faith that she has this very deep, deep faith in Mr. Wilford. But then when she finds out that he's not alive, when she finds out the engine is deserted, that he's not up there, you really see that, that change in her face. And I love her voiceover at the beginning. I, I'm, I'm with you earlier. We were talking about, I wish I had jotted it down. I listened to it briefly before we started recording. And I really like the fact that she's in that voiceover. She's talking about the fact that people have taken for granted what Mr. Wilford has done. And she says, not me. I don't take for granted that he knows the discipline. He knows what we need. He knows all these things. And it almost seems like she should have, I wonder if Melanie had been up front with her at the beginning, if she would have been able to put her faith in Melanie. I don't think so. Yeah. Cause she just, her admiration for him and the way he's on a pedestal would not have transferred. It wouldn't have. Cause Melanie would have had to let her know why Mr. Wilford isn't there. Yeah. And I thought the, the ironic thing about that cold open is how she's talking every point she's making about Mr. Wilford is exactly what Melanie is doing. And she's not able to transfer that on to Melanie. I mean, there hasn't been a lot of time for her to do that, but everything she's saying is what Melanie is doing. Mm -hmm. That's her role. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's really good. You bring that up because it does show that, and I've got the Melanie character. I'm going to talk about her in my, my next point is that I think the difference was she lacks the charisma that Mr. Wilford had, that I think he must have had some sort of a charisma that everybody who talks about him, they talk in awe of him, even though they literally have not seen him for seven years. Mm -hmm. And how many of them really did, I guess, well, the first class would have all met him when they boarded. Yeah, it seems like it, because I know that's what Commander Gray says, says that he shook his hand mm -hmm. seven years ago or something like that. So I don't want to miss this point of Allison Wright and her acting just being so good that especially there towards the end as she gets to see the truth and she goes in there and she talks to Melanie and you can hear it in her voice that there's a shame she feels that she feels that she should have realized that it's like you can see the wheels turning in her head that she's going yeah I haven't actually spoken directly to him or seen his actual face for seven years but I had such deep faith in him I missed all the clues right and she's just crushed she's crushed yeah completely and her, like you said, you can see it on her face and her face acting. I mean, mm -hmm. they all, it's so subtle and the director is so smart in letting them do that without words conveying so much. Mm -hmm. You know, when she's talking to Commander Gray, that shift in the tone in her voice. Exactly. She gets that steely resolve. Exactly. Cold as ice. All right. So what is your next point? We started on it. It's that subtle and powerful face acting mm -hmm. that yeah. uh, the, the character of Ruth has and that actress is doing wonderful. I remember her in The Americans and it's a very different role. Some similarities, but her face acting through that discovery, through talking to Mel. Melanie also yeah. has some great... Uh, oh yeah. Jennifer Connelly. The, the way she can just... Yes, she's amazing. There are so many of these actors are, 
but those subtle shifts in her face too and how she keeps that composure and you can almost see a split second of a beat where she has to keep the composure and play through her role till she loses it. Yeah, exactly. And I love that you bring that up about Jennifer Connelly, about her acting ability as well, because we see her, especially in that scene where she walks in and she starts to try to defend herself and Ruth says, no, don't even talk. And then Ruth says her thing and then she lets Melanie have her talk. And I loved how the episode, at least for me, the last time watching it, it really brought me through all the emotions with the Melanie character. I started to sympathize with her finding out about her daughter. And we should have known that her daughter didn't make it on the train because all we saw was pictures of her. Right. But it hadn't occurred to me until it was actually spoken that she said, oh, my daughter didn't make it to the train. And so we start to sympathize with her. And then we hear her give that confession to Ruth where she says, all Wilford wanted to do was party and drink and have sex in the night car. And that was all he was going to do, just party with his friends. And he, we wouldn't have survived one revolution. And then she reveals that she left him on the platform. He didn't even get on the train. Yeah. And, and so suddenly we start to go, oh, yeah, this is the woman who froze Josie. I lost my liking of her for a second because I was just like, okay, now I'm not going to sympathize with her. But then at the same time, you go through this whole gambit of, of emotions with her. And Jennifer Connelly played it so well that it just really had me going back and forth to where I'm still not convinced where am I at with this character? Do I, you know, is she good? Is she bad? Is she, you know, what is it? A pragmatist that is, or a realist? What is she? I want to kind of know where does she fall in this spectrum? Is she going to be able to deal with the fallout of the whole train figuring out that Mr. Wilford's not alive? I, I think she's, she's really smart. I mean, she's an engineer, but she's really smart. She's had to be rather ruthless to keep the train rolling, whether it was keeping it mechanically rolling or socially rolling. Um, she's just done what it's, what's needed. And if she gets a chance, I think she will yet. And I think she wouldn't give a flip if first class just disappears. I think she's really aware <laughs> of that, that when she was somewhere in her head thinking, that sooner or later, there's not enough resources for everyone. And that came up in the other episode. That she in her heart somehow knows some people are going to have to be left behind or let go of. And she is all in for letting first class just have their final party and be done. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what is your next point? My next point goes along with that is the strong, smart female characters in this uh in the whole drama, but even in this episode, you know, we have Ruth, like you'd mentioned, we have Melanie, we have Till becoming a stronger character in there and she's great. Yeah, and best Till, I was so impressed with her the more I watched this episode and just the, the realizing when you go back to that second episode or, or whenever it was when Leighton recognized that she was a cop, that you were a cop. And even though he knows, oh, she was just a rookie or she was whatever, one year on the job, he knows that she, at her heart, that's what she is. She's a good cop and she's going to stay that way no matter what. And I love that, especially love that scene when she's confronted by the brakeman and Roche and Osweiler say something to her about being with the tailies. And she's like, I chose a side. I just loved that line. I chose a side. Right. That conversation she has with Jinju, that she seems that she's losing Jinju in this. And, you know, what happened to her? We haven't seen her. Well, and she, it, that's even with the well-written, strong female characters. She says, I chose a side. She's not apologetic. This is just, this is what you need to do. You choose a side because it's going to happen. Exactly. You know, and then when she talks to her, the lead brakeman. Roche. Roche. And mentions his family, you know, and, and he even you can see when he chooses a side, Ugh, I'm going to have to go back and tell my wife. Yeah. Yeah. That there is no Mr. Wilford, you know, and then he says, step aside and they all get to make their own choice. But I will bet you every single one of them makes the same choice Till and Roche did. Well, except for Osweiler, who knows what he's going to do. Yeah. <laughs> Osweiler and Pike. Those are the two, yeah. the two wild cards oh, here. Oh my God. My next point is we talked a little bit about it. We said we were going to talk about it is just the fighting between the jackboots and the tailies. I love that spike throwing machine that they had down there in, in the tunnels. And I just loved that till there she's handing out the weapons to all the different fighters in Leighton saying you'll be fine. Telling uh, the one woman, I think it's Astrid is her name. The one that Josie kept switching places with. 
on the sanitation crew. And I got confused when I first watched this episode. I was like, wait, is that Josie? I thought she died. But then I realized, oh, no, it's a whole different, it's this other character. But she's really kind of taken over that role. And I love that we we think there's a victory there. And then the smoke grenades get thrown in. I, I love the homage to Seven with the guard's head being in a box. And uh, I just, <laughs> when I saw that the last time and he opened up that box, I was like, oh, it's Seven. But we're actually seeing the head this time. And I, I just love that whole close quarters fighting they were going on there in, I think they were in the night car for most of that battle. And it was so tight. And just the way the camera shot, when they had that shot going down, you just see all the different bodies and you see people getting their hands chopped off and that was Astrid wasn't it I think it was I think I had that in my notes that it looked like she was the one that got her hand chopped off and poor Susan's son when Leighton is looking at him giving him that like attaboy look and he just gets skewered right through the middle oh. that broke my heart when they think they have the victory and then it's just snatched out of there that was crushing yeah, definitely. When those when those grenades came in and the gas started, and I was just like, "What is going to happen?" And then the next scene is they're basically talking about the lane, the lines kind of stabilizing, and Leighton says, well, "We got to keep pushing forward." And you hear Gray say, "Well, we've got to defend." Um, I loved those final images we have of kind of of Commander Gray and Leighton. Both of them are still just covered in blood. They've not stopped to clean up or anything, and they're going to keep fighting. And it's like these two generals, and you know now we've got to find out what are the brakemen going to do, because uh, they haven't been involved in this fight yet. I yeah I think I think they're going to become part of the one train one train one train. I love that. I love that speech. I got goosebumps when I heard Layton's speech, and I had this later in my notes. I, I was comparing it kind of to the Independence Day speech from the movie Independence Day, when the person in the tail of one guy says one tail, and Layton goes no, it's one train. Oh, I'm getting goosebumps now just talking yeah. about it because I thought it was just so cool when they changed that chant from one tail. To one train. Yes. And it's beautiful the way, I mean, the tailies, of course, they're all going to have different feelings at different times, but they're so willing to go, okay, yeah, we're all in this together. Yeah. Yeah. We've talked about a lot. What else have you got there that we haven't talked about yet? That would have been, actually, that would have been my number two that you're just talking about was the coming together of the tailies and the third, um, the factions, even the brakemen, entertainment, general population, they're all coming together. We're going to see that in the next two episodes, I think. Even the men being froze, unfrozen from the drawers. Everybody's going to come together. They're going to choose sides. And I think it's predictable. Well, for me anyway, I have ideas about who's going to choose what side. And I love it. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm excited. I saw a little bit of the preview before my DVR cut it off. And I was almost disappointed that I saw the preview. Because I was like, no, I don't want to be spoiled. So, yeah, I, I'm excited for the finale coming up. I loved all those final scenes setting us up for the finale that, you know, like I talked about already, the lines kind of stabilizing. You talked about the guys in, in the drawers. I love that when strong boy comes out of the drawer and he's speaking Mandarin Yep. and uh, the one guy says, well, what, he didn't speak Chinese before. And the guy goes, no, he didn't speak, mm -hmm. you know, and those guys, even though we don't know their fates yet, I think they're still hiding out. They were going to wait for the tailies and everyone coming forward. And that was part of Leighton's plan, but they got cut off. Right. And the night train. And that, that actually was my number one. Right. Was that right. reveal that people are changing in those drawers. Yeah. And we saw Leighton dreaming and there was a question of, you know, was he dreaming? Was that, you know, was that knowledge we had before was, or was that his real mm -hmm. dreaming? And when, when he starts speaking Mandarin, it's like, yeah. People are not just frozen in those drawers. They're, they're either changing, they're having ideas, things implanted. Who knows what that is? But I loved that. It was part of one of my comments way back, you know, stopping and looking at all the books that Melanie had on her shelf. You know, biology, Darwin, the perfection of the human race. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like, oh, there's the reveal. What's going to happen? What is her plan? She's going to keep the race alive. Right. Yeah, and it was it was a little bit, I don't want to say disappointed, but because those guys really seemed to come out of it a lot faster than mm -hmm. Leighton. You know, Leighton, it, it looked like it took him a whole day or day and a half to get over being in the drawers for just a month. And these guys have been in the drawers at least a few weeks longer, mm -hmm. but yet we see Pike eating cake, 
talking without any problems. We see Strong Boy, you know, come out speaking Mandarin, and his teeth didn't. I couldn't really see his teeth well, but it didn't look like he had the black teeth all that much. Right. So I wonder if there's different ways people are treated in the drawers as well, and and how much of that are we going to get? Or different levels that people are put to sleep or frozen. And also, I don't think it's been a week. I was trying to follow. This is the first time we didn't have like the good morning message from Melanie or anyone, Mm -hmm. because you always said what day it was from departure. Right, right. And the other departures, I believe, were like two or three days. Not long had passed. When Leighton comes out of the drawer, there's a comment because um, because Zara is so far along in her pregnancy. There's a comment that he was gone, that he was missing for a month. Really, I didn't catch that. So I, I don't know if that missing for a month included the time before he got put in the drawer or just how long he was in the drawer. But we also know that I'm, I'm assuming, and I said I think I said this in the last episode, that Zara's child, that's Leighton's child that she's carrying. And so it would fit if it's been about six weeks or so since they had sex in the night car six or seven. I don't know. I don't know pregnancy. I don't know how long it takes for a woman. to. <laughs> well, and I, I'm a timeline person, so I'm going to have to go back and look at that because my reaction at that point was, you know, unless there's a special, like, quick pregnancy test on there, which, you know, scares resources. Right. I don't know how she would know she was pregnant that fast, but I was thinking it was a matter of days. Yeah, and I don't think so. So I'm a timeline person. I have to go back and look at that. Yeah, I, I don't think so. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm 99% sure I remember them saying that he's been missing for a month. That makes a whole lot more sense, Steve. Yeah. Okay, so um, I had one quote here, and you've got a quote, so we'll share those, and then we'll go into our notes. I just, we were already talking about it, but where Ruth was talking to Nolan, and she says, you've shaken his hand, talking about Mr. Woodford, and Nolan says, not since departure, I haven't. It just made me realize that it's been seven years since these people have actually seen Mr. Wilford, so. Right, and that, like you said, the devotion. They just, they have him on a pedestal, almost cult-like, especially first you know, first class, the first section. The rest, I think, are just trying to survive. But they all have the little W symbol or signal that they do. They do it in first a lot. I've seen it um, in second, also in third, I think. Yeah, yeah. But you better believe the tailies are not doing that. Yeah, yeah. It's a religion, that's for sure. And what was your quote there? Oh, it was um, about revolution because it comes up in Ruth's first monologue, the name of the of the episode. But when Melanie is in the engine speaking to Miles and they're talking about the revolutions, we'll be in Chicago in a day and a half. And he mentions the revolution time frame. She says, we lose a little each revolution. So it's up to us to reverse that. And I thought, yeah, that is not just about the time it takes to make that revolution. Right. We lose a little each revolution. There have been res- revolutions before. Yeah. You know, and, and she's trying to reverse everything they've lost or, you know, keeping the peace. So I love that quote. Yeah, exactly. That's that's a good poll there. And I did not put that together because they did say that there was a revolt. There's been like three or four revolts in the last seven years. So we know that this has happened before where they've tried to take over the train and been unsuccessful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and that was... That was part of the plan or what we started out with the first episode where Susan was punished because they were working on another revolution. But I think that's foreshadowing for what's going to happen in the next two episodes too. the revolutions. Yeah, obviously. Absolutely. So we've got a couple of notes or a few notes here that we haven't already discussed. Uh, mine, one of mine is real quick that we hadn't. I didn't realize, and I don't know why I didn't realize it before this episode. I didn't realize that the jackboots and the brakemen are two different groups. Sure. Like, it's kind of like the military and the police. Exactly. It didn't, when they kept saying jackboots, I thought that was like a a slur for the brakeman. I thought that was like a, you know, a bad word for brakeman or something, something along those lines. I didn't realize that the jackboots were an actual other group. Yeah. And isn't it a term used in World War II? I know they they talked about like fascism and Nazis, jackbooted Nazis Mm -hmm. and and things like that. So I'm sure that's what the connotation is supposed to be. There is is that kind of militaristic kind of attitude. It it makes makes me wonder who named them that. Did Melanie name them that? Was that Wilford's name for him? Commander Gray probably came up with that on his own. Who knows? That could be, but I just, why would you call your team the jackboots? That just seems a, I don't know. Uh, If you're a fascist, it makes sense. (laughs) I guess, I guess. 
Oh, we already talked about Leighton's notes, uh, the brakeman standing aside. You know, it seems they put this plan together really quickly, and it was pretty, maybe not elaborate, but there was definitely, there was a lot of moving parts to this plan that I think really came to came together quickly like they had the the electrical guys a taily from you know taily hooking up with the electrical person to get rid of the communication lights the woman who sets up the right viewing of outside even though it was upside down to kind of bring up everyone's spirits right exactly and then you had the guys in the tunnels that was a whole nother section of the plan the guys in in the tunnels and you had the different and they talked about having different areas to defend. In fact, that's what the, the one guy who sacrificed himself tells him. You go to the next barrier, take the weapon with you. I'll slow them down here. Yeah, that was Big John. Yeah. Oh. That, and that was part of my note in there, too, was, you know, all of the casualties, you know, the people sacrificing themselves. Um, Susan's son. Now, her daughter's going to be all alone, the little silent girl in, oh. in the tail. Um, and like I had mentioned, that just cr was crushing, heartbreaking to watch him go. And, you know, we had little John and, and poor Astrid's hand. And then last last week, of course, everybody, you know, knows about Josie. That was a big sacrifice. You know, she froze her own hand so she could. That's crazy. Yeah, we were talking about, or I was talking with somebody about the fact, I think it might have been my nephew, by the way. Thank you to my nephew. He sends, he's been sending in feedback. It was really cool to hear his feedback read by Mark on the last couple episodes ago. All right, so we did get some other feedback here as well. We got some feedback from Alex. Alex says, OMG, what an amazing episode from start to finish. It was a battle of the bastards on a train. I got that same feeling of anxiety and lack of breath. I love how they had so many storylines working at once. This show is never afraid of moving the story along. It's not scared to reveal anything at any time. The secret of Mr. Wilford, I really thought, would have taken longer, but instead they ripped the curtain right off. <laughs> Melanie is such a complex character. You said it, Alex. You're not sure if it's about her, the train, or something else. I really believe she loves the train like she loves her own daughter. The play with Miles was a good move on face value, but she had to know it would backfire in some way. The kids were too smart and loyal to the tale. How can you not love the brakemen? They are the lower class of security. Michael Malley has done a great job of being the head. He's as, he's smart and knows they will have to clean up the pieces after all is said and done. Osweiler is such a rat. He reminds me of Ike Clanton from the movie Tombstone. <laughs> Big talk, but runs at a moment's notice. Two words, spear launcher. <laughs> How can you love... How can you love that not to mention it's on a moving train? Hello. Lastly, First Class thinks they can be in charge. The conversation between Melanie and Ruth was heartbreaking. Stephen Ogg as Pike cannot be more slimy. I'm still not over him on The Walking Dead. The Pendleton episode was great. Yes. Can't wait for next week's two-hour ending. Thank you so much, Alex. Yeah, some great points in there about just uh, the spear launcher I, I love the tombstone reference and uh, just all the all the stuff so thank you very much for that alex right and how could we not bring up pike before this yeah yeah i mean i briefly said something about him but didn't really we didn't really go into too deep of just his hatred we didn't even get an inkling i don't think of his hatred of leighton earlier in the series Part of me is wondering if it's going to end up being a put on that he's not really like that. But at the same time, I kind of hope he is. Yeah, I, I don't know about hatred, but he, certainly you could see the dislike. And I hadn't thought about that. If it's a double cross, that would be amazing. But how is Stephen Ogg wonderful at this character? Oh, he's so good. He's so good. He does so much with just just a few lines, but maybe it's because we love him in another you know another show and knew him well from there. So. There is that, and Westworld. He he does a great job. He did a great job in Westworld as well. Oh, and that just a, a crazy stray thought. Uh, was talking about this with actually Daphne and Mark last week about Ben Benton in the front car. Mm -hmm. He is from Westworld also. Oh wow! He was Maeve's counterpart i called him the cowboy no he wasn't okay the main cowboy but um yeah he was mave's partner in crime in that i didn't catch that yeah i okay. love picking out all these actors that have been in other things 
you know, including one that popped up in very, first very class cool. from a yeah. lot of other science fiction. So I'm, I'm interested to see if he has a little bigger role. So, so then we also got uh, some feedback from Paik, our good friend Paik. He says, what an incredible episode. Everything is really coming to a head for the season finale event. I love the way Melanie's entire world crumbled around her. She has been trying to do her best, but it has fallen apart. LJ was a risky chess piece, and I still really worry about Miles in this situation. I love that kid, and I'd hate for anything to happen to him. He is crucial. The revolution begins, and wow, is it bloody. Those metal spears being launched were insane, and that nightclub battle was intense. My only complaint is that I don't quite buy Pike selling out so easily. He doesn't get along with Leighton, I understand. But to turn on his entire tail to help the jackboots seems a little hard to believe. I hope he has a little something more up his sleeve. Yeah, and we were just talking about that, about the possibility of, of a double cross. Um, yeah, I, I love, we didn't talk much, much about Miles either. There was a, I noticed this last watch at the beginning of the episode before he lets LJ into the engine. He's holding a watch and he's looking at maps and he's looking at the train. And you can see that he really wants to learn what the engineers are doing, what the pilots of the train are doing. And that was, that was really cool. And I'm going to take this moment to talk a little bit more about Javi. Cause I think Javi kind of gets the short end of the stick in this episode. He's been stuck in that engine for seven years. He mentioned this to the other guy a week or so ago where he says, at least you have Melanie. I don't even have that. I can't have a girlfriend cause I might slip and say something wrong. He's basically been a prisoner up there yeah. for these seven years. And then he's the one who reveals the truth. He lets Ruth and Commander Gray into the engine. He tells them the truth. And what does he get for it? He gets carted off by the jackboots, I'm assuming to a cell or maybe a drawer, who knows, but they took him away. Well, he, ch he chose sides. He didn't choose early enough, that's for sure. He just didn't choose wisely, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> And he's been so isolated. I can relate to that. You know, he's up there. Who knows if he's even seen another person besides Mel and Bennett. Exactly. Exactly. Now we also have some audio feedback from our, our good friend, Mark. Mark is, is taking some time off, as I said earlier, but he has submitted in some feedback. So let's see if we can get that played now. Hey, panelers, Mark here. I just wanted to say thank you to Steve and Kat for covering this week's episode. I'm taking a little time now. <laughs> just like uh, Steve did. So I did actually get to watch the episode. I was really happy with the episode. It's really amazing. It's pretty funny because now you're thinking, hey, I should be on this. Mark should be on this. No. But I have to thank them for doing this this week. And I'm just going to give you a few thoughts about episode eight. These are his revolutions. And I just want to say I love the gold opening with Ruth you know, praising Mr. Wolford about keeping people alive. I just love the openings from people's perspectives of how their lives are on the train and their thoughts. The fact that Melanie's world is now crashing on her with the leaked information of Mr. Wolford not being on board, which I think is somewhere on the train. He, I, he's got to be there. He's got to be in a drawer, perhaps. I don't think he's gone. The rebellion with the with an actual, you know, the tail and the third and how they are making things hard for everyone else and getting the brakemen involved. This is the start of everything, and this is pretty cool, and that's where everything is going, I think. The tail is getting very tactical, which is awesome. I love that idea. They're actually, you know, forming a group. And I really liked Andre's speech. I love that speech. One of the best parts of the episode, in my opinion. I was a little annoyed that the engineer told Ruth that Wolford was dead, and I really don't think he is, so yeah, that was the only drawback to it. I'm like, come on, he, he's not dead. And by the way, using Crazy Pants Lila Jr. was fun. And then that quote that she gives, the tailies? <laughs> you know, she got all excited when they said that they were doing an uprising all excited about it and everything plus when she was brought into the front of the train at the very beginning to see what it looked like and i think she might be some trouble in the near future in some degree with what's going on with this uh, whole rebellion and that ending wow i i can't wait to see what is going to happen next and by the way panelers our next episode our 100th yes our 100th will be a celebrity interview with none other than the AMC's 
comic book men. We're going to have Michael Zapchik and Ming Chen on the actual podcast, as well as a video version that will go on to YouTube. So that's why we've been plugging away at YouTube lately, as we do. And we just love the idea of having it. So that will be available this week as well. Not right after this, obviously, so give it a couple of days. But I can't wait to come back on so we could talk about this season finale. And I'll catch you all on the next panel. And thanks again to Stephen Cat for covering this week. Good night, everybody. Well, thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate all your thoughts. And it's possible, I guess, maybe Melanie's lying about Mr. Wilford, but I, I don't think so. I, I think she was telling the truth. I think she left him on the, the platform and he's nowhere to be found. I'm not so sure about that. But I think she, she probably did tell poor Javi that he was dead. I just, I don't know. That's an, It's an interesting thought. Because you would think that would be a card that she would play if he actually is in a drawer somewhere or something like that, that that would have been a card she would have played at some point, but maybe not. Well, here's a thought. Maybe she does not know he's in a drawer. Hmm. Oh, okay. That could happen. She might think she left him there and there's some faction or group that stuck him in there because I don't think that Melanie has done all of this alone. Hmm. Okay. Possibly. I think with... Jinju knows something, the two of them have partnered on something, because even when she's talking to Till, she says, don't make me choose between you and the train. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, okay. All right. Their allegiance is to the train, and I think that means survival. Okay. All right. Well, we'll see some more uh, next week, I guess. Yeah. Any more comments about the, the episode as a whole, just overall, or? No, I think we have covered everything except that little light bulb that just went on i i think that might happen it'll be great it'll be great to find out interesting so you had something to, to add for comic talk that i didn't even know about oh yes i have been so i always love the movie i'm loving this series more than i can say so i've gotten really interested and we know that it was based on a french graphic novel and i believe it was from 1982 or 84 and there was a prequel that came out the first one was Extinction, and it is it covers the first three months prior to Extinction event. The next one is coming out in August, and it's prequel part two, hmm. Apocalypse. And it's, it covers days following the Extinction event. Very cool. I know that I have pre-ordered the three-book Amazon boxed set of the original graphic novels, so uh, those are not going to be released, I think, until like September is what Amazon said, or October. Yeah, September 23rd or 22nd, I think. And I've got the first prequel um, on order, and then pre-order on the second one, because I am I love this story, and I got to find out. Yeah. Got to find out how all this happened to begin with. Once the, the series, the season one ends, I'm going to go back and rewatch the movie. I know it's different, but uh, there's some things that my nephew was talking about that, that are in the movie that I had totally forgot. I had totally forgot that the drawers are in the movie. So, yeah, I totally totally block that out because all i watched was the fighting <laughs> in, the, in the movie so all right um well got some podcast recommendations i just uh, just one quick one i'm the we have to go back lost revisited podcast it's a joint podcast between the this Le this network the next level podcast network and podcastica ben and Kristen are, are re-watching lost and they are back chugging at it every week. I, I missed a couple of weeks of sending feedback in. So uh, I've got to get back on that train, pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be lost without your feedback, Steve. I know. I know. I felt bad. <laughs> Listeners are going to be worried about what happened to Steve. Yeah, I got messages. People are asking me about Cobra Kai on House Podcasting as well. Hey, when are you coming back? All right, I'll get to it. Just give me a chance, guys. <laughs> People will be relieved to know Steve is alive and well and doing okay. <laughs> So to submit feedback to our podcast, obviously you can find us on any of your podcast player of choice. I'm not even going to try to name them all because there's bunches of them out there. If there's an opportunity to give us a review, please give us a five-star review out there. We have a website. It is panels to pixels podcast.com. Our Facebook page is the best place to interact with us. And that's facebook.com slash panels to pixels. You can email us just like Alex did at panels to pixels one at gmail.com. That's panels to pixels one the to is spelled out right there in the middle and the number one 
at gmail.com. You can also leave us an old school voicemail at 845-350-2095. That's 845-350-2095. Or you can email us like Mark did, like other people do. Email us a audio clip of yourself and we will play that on the podcast. We also are on YouTube, as Mark mentioned. Our 100th episode especially will be a video on YouTube, and you can find us at Panels to Pixels Podcast. Go out there, give us a thumbs up, subscribe to us, and check us out. I am excited for this 100th episode. That is quite a milestone. We've been doing this for two years, and it just it just gets better and better. We keep finding new things to review. We keep finding new friends to jump on the podcast with us, or old friends, I guess. Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's exciting. You guys have done a wonderful job, and wow, 100 episodes. So I get a sneak peek at that interview, too, you guys. It's wonderful. It's, it's really fun. Yes, yes, I, I fanboyed. I'll admit, I got a little fanboy excited during it. So but that's all for tonight. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'm Steve. And I'm Kat. And this was Panels to Pixels, and we will catch you on the next panel. Good night. Good night.